Shipping slowdowns are happening everywhere. We are all connected. So if one major port goes down, it literally impacts the whole sum of all the parts. The Ever Given, which clogged up the super important Suez Canal back in March of 2021, was the canary in the coal mine for recent global trade slowdowns. But before this calamity, disruptions from the COVID-19 pandemic hit port after port, with the aftershocks hitting the consumer market. There's a scarcity of capacity of ships, there's a scarcity of empty containers which we have never seen before. The container ships that travel between the world's major ports are a marvel of engineering. 90% of world trade moves on water. In 2019, 11.1 billion tons of goods were moved across the world's oceans. And according to the World Shipping Council, the liner industry moves more than $4 trillion in goods annually. These vessels depend on people to get them from A to B and the complex logistics systems that make up the global trade network. But what happens when things don't go according to plan? Container ships are a relatively recent innovation. In the late 1950s, the concept of a standardized container being loaded onto a ship was revolutionary. These containers could be offloaded onto freight trains or long-haul trucks, and goods could be efficiently shipped to where they were needed all around the globe. Container ships went from being an American innovation to being dominated by international companies, and the ships themselves grew in size. Container ships get ranked by 20-foot equivalent units, or TEUs. One TEU roughly measures out to the size of a shipping container, about 20 feet long, 8 feet wide, and 8 feet tall. This helps measure how many containers a ship can hold. The earliest container ships held only 58 containers. The largest operating today can hold about 23,964. Now some are asking, are container ships getting too big? The problem is we have seen with these mega vessels and the piling and piling of containers, we have lost hundreds of containers in the past year and they've fallen into the ocean just because they're they're very big and you know if, if you're on a you're on a big ship you're stacked to the brim you hit a really big wave or there's turbulence in the water so to speak we have seen accidents in that way so that's why a lot of people are kind of questioning do we go with these mega ships or do we go with something that maybe is 12,000 TEUs or 12,000 containers versus the 20,000. There are around 5,446 active container ships worldwide that are fully cellular, which can move around 25 million TEUs. A fully cellular container ship is one that is efficiently organized to haul containers. This means that in the global shipping industry, there are thousands of possible points of failure that can slow down the system. We are, of course, not very happy with the situation. You could say you can be happy because you're, you're profitable, um, and this is the first time since many years, since a decade, when the container industry really burned billions of, of dollars. And now this is a profitable year for sure. But of course, schedule reliability is pretty much down. Quality is pretty much down. You know, consumers and, and our customers are annoyed because, you know, there are huge delays. Cargo is piling up at the ports. There's no capacity. Rates are going up. So. It is a very, very challenging and difficult situation for everybody in this industry. The container ship industry went through a series of mergers in the last decade that led to the consolidation of the major container ship companies. Hapig Lloyd bought two firms, Maersk another, and China's Costco also made several moves that included a merger and buying another company, OOCL, for a reported $6.3 billion. The companies that remained after these mergers also joined a series of alliances to help keep costs down. Another factor, political conditions, can change how the industry operates. Well, this story really dates back three years ago to the introduction of our trade policy and tariffs under Section 232 and 301. We've seen a very choppy supply chain ever since. Imports were brought in being mindful of new tariff milestones. So we would have rushes of cargo and then a little bit of a lull. We saw this phenomenon called front loading. And that was a big catchphrase that we that we heard throughout 2019. And what that essentially is was all the retailers knew when the deadline was when they would start paying these tariffs. So what they did was they started bringing in tremendous volumes of product that they did not need, but they wanted to get it into the United States before the tariff hit. So what happened was you had all these containers coming in, which actually crippled the ports because there are not enough people 
to process all of those containers. Then as we got into COVID-19's environment, we saw cargo plummet by nearly 20% in the first five months of last year. And then the American consumer developed a buying surge, the likes of which we've never seen here in the United States. And during this surge in demand, a critical canal was paralyzed, creating a cascade of delays in container delivery. And so what happens is you have what's called the sale effect. So the higher that you go, if you have a big wind gust, it can physically move the vessel. And because the Ever Given was so large, it's not like when you're in your car and you turn the wheel and you immediately can go left or right. It takes a few minutes for a vessel to uh, to react to the way that you're moving. When the Ever Given was stuck in the Suez Canal, shipping companies had to make the hard choice of staying in line at the Suez or taking much longer routes to destinations. The Suez Canal for us was a pretty uh, unique incident because for more than 20 years, basically nothing big happened like that. It was the very first time from our alliance partners, we decided to, to have six ships going via the Cape of Good Hope just to save the time, the waiting time. But of course, this is more costly. You burn more fuel, it takes one week longer. So we decided to stay in the queue. And I think we had like, out of these 300 ships, nine of them were from Habak Lloyd. Companies rely on just-in-time logistics to get consumers' products at low prices. But when something like the Suez blockage happens, delivery of key items built for sale and as raw materials for manufacturing are delayed. When COVID-19 kicked off, there were warning signs in the trade market. So when you look at trade, it really is almost common sense. Trade takes people. So what we're seeing now with the NTN and what we saw at the pandemic, things had to shut down. And what happened? No one was making product. Product couldn't move onto vessels. And then we had this tremendous surge of volume that we're, set, that we're still seeing today. Fewer workers mean slower loading and unloading of ships. Those on ships have to worry about crew members becoming infected with COVID-19, which has led to ships being quarantined numerous times in the last year. The virus concern could lead to even more automation of container ships. But ports still rely on people to get containers pointed in the right direction. As the vaccination rate increases, these slowdowns should decrease, but new variants could cause unexpected disruptions. What we are watching very closely now is the recent outbreak of COVID-19 in South China at some of its major ports around the Pearl River Delta. About one third of our vessels that come here to Los Angeles begin in South China's region. They had some COVID infections which were not expected. Uh, they basically closed down a very important part of the, of the port. They have a daily throughput of, throughput of roughly 40,000 containers. And if, if you know, um, a port like this is down or partly down, you know, this has a huge effect. The container shipping industry is responsible for 2.5% of the world's global greenhouse gases. That's one major reason why the industry is striving for sustainability. Uh, there are so many different alternative energies that they're, that they're working on right now. It's pretty exciting at the amount of innovation uh, that, they're, that they're pouring into, into this industry because the maritime industry does contribute to a lot of uh, CO2. We're also moving in a direction of becoming a zero emissions port by the year 2030 and a zero emissions heavy duty truck port by the year 2035. A company from Norway called Yara hopes the future of container ships are electric and autonomous. Its zero emission and crew optional container ship, which will be used for regional cargo movement, could be a peak into the future of the industry. Yara Bitclown is a relatively small container ship, so it has a battery capacity of about uh, 7,000 electrical cars. And the purpose is to transport uh, containers from our the fertilizer plant in Porskeden out to a bigger container harbor. The Arab Bitcoin will also be electrical, zero emission, and being developed to be, on the later stage, autonomous, without a crew. Automation is also an area where the industry hopes to move into the future. We cannot leave our workforce behind. We have to bring them along, and whether it's reskilling or upskilling, finding additional cargo that requires that great skilled labor, or making sure that we now know that the mechanic who works on all this equipment will no longer carry a wrench, but maybe a computer, is all part of how we have to advance. 